Hello and welcome to EPR with your favorite environmental enthusiasts, Nick and Laura. On today's episode, Laura and I discuss our fishing exploits. We talk to Godfrey Oyama about biodiversity, wildlife, and sustainability. And finally, some tarantulas in the Amazon have pet frogs. <laughs> These, that's, a, the, that's adorable. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, I thought you would. It's... Um, it's kind of funny. These these buddy frogs guard the spider's eggs from ants and other insects trying to eat them, while the spiders provide protection from frogs. So, you know, how about that? They'll actually literally hide underneath the tarantula. Like, they'll literally just be sitting there under there, hanging out with them. So they really are like pets. It's kind of hilarious. <laughs> That's awesome. I need the pictures. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Google it. Google it. It's actually really cute. <laughs> All right. Hit that music. Are you interested in PFAS? The next NAAP webinar titled PFAS Emergence, Is It Summer Yet? will be a mid-2022 update on PFAS policy risk and treatment, and it will take place June 23rd, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. Check it out at naap.org. We appreciate all of our sponsors and they are what keep the show going. If you'd like to sponsor the show, please head over to environmentalprofessionalsradio.com and check out the sponsor form for details. Now let's get to our segment. Do you fish? No, my grandfather, <laughs> my grandfather fished. I, uh, that was like his pastime, but not mine. Um, Did he try to make you fish? Oh, yeah, of course. I've, I have fished plenty of times. I have caught fish. I have caught large fish. We've been doing deep sea fishing as well. No, oh. but yeah, <laughs> it's very dismissive. No. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of things are you looking for in deep sea fishing? I've never done this. I don't want to. Well, I mean, I think if you asked me to do if I would do it now, I probably wouldn't. It just doesn't doesn't quite hit the right note with me now. But at the time, it was, you know, we did it a few times when as a kid. We would go out to, you have to go out several miles. You have to really go out there. You know, you get these long poles and just put squid on a hook and, and drop it in the water and you just pull up whatever. There's nothing uh, nuanced or interesting about what we did. It was much more of a, that's like the touristy side of things. It was just like a, isn't that neat? Look, I caught a flounder, you know, which are super strong, by the way. I didn't realize that. And, uh, <laughs> they look like monsters, actually. Their teeth, very big. Um, Wait, a flounder, how big? The one I caught was two feet. So it's not, okay. not small, but, you know, when you're 10, it seems, you know, humongous. And so, yeah, it was like, it felt like it was the same size as me. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's other kinds of deep sea fishing too, but the, 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 you know, you're going for like the tuna and the sharks and stuff like the that. Marlins. Do people still fish Marlins? Yeah, I think so actually. And there's some, you know, you can still, you can definitely still do that. The records aren't get, really getting broken anymore, but. Um, well, that's sad. <laughs> well, the, the fish are adapting. It's weird. Like they're actually getting. Oh, well, that's not sad. They're getting uh, sexual. Reaching. I'm like, go fish. <laughs> yeah, they're getting smarter. They're reaching sexual maturity earlier. They're having more. They're getting there faster. So the smaller ones are basically reproducing. So they're kind of. We're basically selecting for small fish will survive. It's kind of. <laughs> so they're oh, like, okay, we'll get no, smaller. I was thinking the other way. I thought they were like, oh, fish hook. I'm not biting that. <laughs> oh God, no. I that's how they were getting smarter. No, no, no that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, go fish. Yeah. <laughs> There we go. Yeah, that's <laughs> wow. That, those are those are my jokes, Laura. If you could just let me tell the dad ones. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. I got you know my uncle does a lot of fly fishing as well. It's another unique... people like fly fishing. Mm -hmm. I could see that being very peaceful. Maybe yeah, it's definitely yeah, a different vibe than deep sea fishing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. But it was so wait, wait. I'm being rude here. Are you a fisherman? <laughs> i am not a, f a fisherwoman yeah. um plenty of fisherwoman friends i guess i don't know it doesn't appeal to me on a lot of different level levels it's not yeah. just the fish are cute thing i have been fishing younger yeah you know one of those things grandpa wanted you to do all the time mm -hmm. let's go yeah. fishing uh. <laughs> yeah. not something i think i've done even one time in my adult life. Nope. I took my, <laughs> my niece one time fishing off of a dock because she wanted to do it. Right. Yeah. She did catch something too. Well, there's, there's like different. <laughs> we yeah. threw it back. Of course. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it was. Yeah. 
But like, that's the thing, like as a kid, you just want to, and it was to drive my grandfather crazy. Cause we we're like, just plopping it right in the front. He's like, no, the big fish are deep. They're deep. You have to throw it. And we're like, yeah, but we can catch these little ones right now. Yeah. You know, isn't that cool? And also, can you take it off the hook, please? <laughs> you know? There is a photo of me with a little shovelhead shark. Mm-hmm. Hammerhead. One of the others I have caught when I was little. Yeah. And I'm proudly, not really proudly. I'm awkwardly like, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's funny. Actually, I, I went uh, fishing for a piranha in uh, the Amazon. Uh, what? I like, forgot about that. Yeah. And, how does uh, that work? Super easy. It's just like... You stick your hand like, in the water you know, and wait. <laughs> no, you put your meat, meat on a string and you just pull it up. It was that simple. And they're just like holding on to it. So you don't, I don't even think we used hooks. It was just like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty funny. Um, but yeah. Yeah, that was kind of wild. Just, I mean, you have to see them. You get to see their teeth. They are terrifying looking, but yeah. So was that like a tour? You were like, okay, tomorrow we're going piranha catching. <laughs> we all kind of like, it was like, we were at the, where we were in the Amazon was with a, a community that had been there, you know, native community. And so they, they built areas for us to stay and took us into the forest to see things. And that was one of the things we saw. And, you know, it was actually, <laughs> there he is. Um, it was actually like a, that was a, a clearing a lake that had just, it was just in the forest and there were river otters everywhere eating the piranha actually in different parts of the lake. And it was really oh, fun. Yeah. And they just like, you could hear them going, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> chomping away at these things. And so, um, yeah, it was really, really cool. So the piranha don't eat the otters. <laughs> no, no, that's good. No, pr- you know, piranha don't really, they have a reputation that is, uh, you know, uh, more Hollywood than, than <laughs> Than you'd expect. If you fall into the water, they're not going to just, you know, nibble like, you to pieces. Yeah. Root, root, root. I think they just, they just chew off your clothes. Is that what <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they chew off your clothes or they chew off all of your skin until you're just a skeleton. <laughs> well, that's the, that's the Hollywood that's, version, right? Yeah. You, you, if a cow walks into a river, it gets, it gets eaten. Um, and all that's left is the bones. Yeah. Right. If it's a cow, it's that, if it's a person, it's just their clothes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> Okay, this is getting very nonsensical. Let's get to our interview. All right, perfect. Welcome back to EPR. Today we have Godfrey Oyema on the show from Tanzania. Godfrey is Assistant Environmental Officer at the UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. He is an ESG sustainability expert, biodiversity, and ecosystem restoration specialist. Welcome, Godfrey. Thank you, Lola, for having me. Awesome. It's good to talk to you again. We were introduced by Tiffany Duong, who's been on our show before, and she was on our live episode just a couple of weeks ago. So I wanted to just start off with like the story of how you and Tiffany know each other. Uh, well, it's Tiffany, she's a friend is friend. Um, yep. So I got connected to her because of having the same uh, passion in the environmental ecosystem sustainability. So that's how we, we got connected. So you were in Tanzania, which, you know, we all love it's uh, as environmentalists, knowing how much environments and habitat and animals are there is always very intriguing. So tell us about some of the work that you do there. Uh, right now, I'm uh, an assistant environment officer with the UN refugee agents. So my role is to you not know, look after environment protection, conservation and the restoration because our operation really interact with the environment so that we don't create a strong environmental footprints. So my role is to advise on how best to implement our humanitarian operations so that our activities have little environmental impact. Awesome. And then what kind of companies or organizations do you work with or do you work with individuals? I'm working with the United Nations responsible for refugees, UNHCR. So I'm a full-time employee. Like I said, my day-to-day activities is to make sure our operations in the camp does not, you know, impact the integrity of the environment. Got you. So tell us about a little bit what your day looks like. What kind of work do you do during the day? What, how, how does your work look? Like if I came to Tanzania and followed you around for a day? 
Well, I have, I have different activities, but basically we have to do monitoring because we have an implementing partner who is looking after environment and the energy initiatives. So for us as a sector expert, we have to make sure we, we monitor our implementing partner so that we, to make sure our project activities are implemented according to project management program and that the compliance is always maintained in terms of you know timeline in terms of deliverables so i would say my day to day activities is, is largely monitoring of those activities and then working in the refugee camp what is that like do you have to interact with people and and also work so work with environmental and people yeah so i get to interact with the, with the different people who are working in the camps that includes the refugee themselves the host communities and the other partners because as you know environment is is cutting across so i get to interact with the different partners including government as well so so as to work together to make sure our operations does not you know significantly impact the environment okay and then are there any specific projects that you're implementing so when you have um, to be sustainable are you working on any specific projects with those plans Oh, yes, we have different projects. One is on uh, soil conservation. We have on uh, water protection conservation. We have the restoration, but also we work on um, uh, sustainable alternative sources of cooking energy. We call it cooking energy uh, solutions, which promote the sustainable use of cooking materials. So one of the main projects is producing a briquette biomass which means people are not cutting forest just for firewood. So we use biomass briquette charcoal as alternative source of cooking energy. Uh, so are there any challenges with your job? Yeah, of course, the challenges are already there, uh, as you know, because um, when it comes to resources, because you see environmental issues, that means we have many of them, but we need a lot of resources so that we can address them in a way that is, you know, is bringing the results we want to see. So I would say financial challenges is one of the of the key issues. But also we have the issue of, you know, people buying into what we are doing because sustainability is all about changing the mentality of people, the behavior of people, but then not all are willing to change. So that means changing that behavior is something very difficult. But yeah, we are trying to do our level best, uh, raising the awareness. But also sometimes duplication because you have different sectors who are doing their own activities, but then you find there are some overlap. So trying to remove that so that to optimize the resources is always difficult because those partners are receiving money from different donors. So changing them to use the money the way you want them to do it is sometimes very, very difficult. But yeah, like I said, it's through dialogue. We always tend to address those issues. Thank you. And uh, do you work only in uh, Tanzania or do you get to travel around? No, for now I'm working only in Tanzania, it's particularly in Kasulu district. That's where our operations are based. So most of the time I'm here. Gotcha. Yeah. And um, so I know biodiversity is also very important to you. And when I think of Tanzania and biodiversity, the first thing I think of is Lake Victoria. And it has one of the most well-known invasive species introduction with the Nile perch. I don't know if everybody listening knows about that. So how has Tanzania managed Nile perch in Lake Victoria? Is what I well, that's a very good question. Yeah, Nile perch, like you said, is an uh, invasive species. And I think it has caused the a lot of ecological issues along Lake Victoria. One was the loss of a native species, uh, because we call native pictures the top predator in Lake Victoria. But then, yeah, there have been so many interventions from the government, but then the intervention has not always, has not been to remove native pitch from Lake Victoria, because if you remove that, that means you are going to collapse the livelihood of so many people who depend on Nile perch because Nile perch is one of the main commercial fish from Lake Victoria. So what I would say, there has never been like a concrete 
government initiative to eliminate the species because right now it has like it has it is part of our eco, our economy so there is no way we can get rid of it but rather to be ready to live with it forever that's all i can say yeah yeah but it's a really good point that you have to look at the biology and the people it's funny though, like I, I always forget like uh, Nile perch, they are humongous mm. fish. They're so yeah. big. Oh, really? I pick, yeah, they're, I picked your perch as little fish. No, they're like four or six feet it is like a two meter fish. What? It is, is that yeah, really I, how big they can get? Yeah, I actually, I remember when I was young, the first time I saw that huge, I actually ran away. I ran away. <laughs> oh, yeah, <of> course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's huge. You know, it's yeah. very huge because I hear people say some of them can even weigh 60 kg plus. Right? Wow. Some can wow. even weigh, I hear some 100. Those fully grown. Yeah. Right? Wow. Yeah. So, so sometimes, let me tell you, you cannot, the fully grown in every page, I cannot even lift it myself. Yeah. I have to have maybe two people to lift it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's what, yeah. That's a really important mm-hmm. one because I, I, in my head, like, I was like, oh, yeah, it's small. No, no, no. They are big. No, it's very big. Yeah. It's very big. So are there other issues, environmental issues in Tanzania that we need to know about? Yeah, of, of course, there are so many issues, uh, environmental issues. Uh, I would start from the Lake Victoria. You know, we have this water hyacinth. If you have read about water hyacinth, mm-hmm. is an invasive weed which has been, you know, impacted so many areas along the lake victoria and that means it has even impacted the way people move around the lake the fishing activities have been sometimes affected so that is one part of it but then the other issues are so many things like deforestation of natural forest because tanzania is one of the developing countries around the world so a large percentage of people depend on uh, on fuel as a source of cooking energy as building materials so deforestation is really going on we have the issue of commercial agriculture so commercial agriculture that means you have to apply a lot of agrochemicals uh, pesticides and as you know when the rain comes yeah, through runoff you find a lot of these you know runoff take those uh, fertilizers into water bodies so you have the issue of water pollution but yeah there are so many issues here around Tanzania, like climate change, that is normal. Um, mm-hmm. We encounter so many droughts, some areas affected with the flood. So those are, are some of the, of the environmental issues that we are, we are facing. But also don't forget about biodiversity loss. That is normal. If you destroy natural forest, what do you expect? Uh, yes. You will lose a lot of species. So those are yeah. some of the environmental issues we are facing in Tanzania. And you mentioned uh, forest deforestation, and you were also a forestry manager at one point. So how difficult was that job? Yeah, it's, it's very difficult because especially if you, are, you have the communities living around the natural forests, and, uh, and if that is their main source of cooking energy or building materials, it is very challenging to, to tell people to protect it if you don't give them alternatives. So... My experience I had from Unilever when I was working as environmental compliance and forestry manager, we had these initiatives of providing fast growing trees, those commercial trees which grow so fast. So we used to give people to establish smaller woodlot so that those trees can come mm-hmm. a source of firewood, do some timber, and sometimes they can even sell it and raise money to cater for other needs. So if you want people to protect the natural forest, you have to have another plan. Otherwise, yeah. you have to be ready. Everything will be gone. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. It's a, you can't, it, don't do that isn't good enough. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You need to do this instead, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so you've had a really good career. You've advanced rapidly, I would say, throughout it. What have been your keys to success in your career? Uh, well, I, I think for me, it's very difficult to pinpoint one thing which has been very great. But then he, yesterday, I think that is something big news for me. Uh, yesterday, I won the, the Sustainability Leader Award of the Year. Oh, wow. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you so much. So I, I think for me, 
that is a very, very huge milestone, a huge achievement because it is my first, you know, to win the, the award of this nature. And um, I think I'm very proud. I'm very excited. And I think it has even motivated me more to do the work I do the best, which is protecting the environment. Yeah. And oh, that's great news. Congratulations again. Um, and uh, yeah, I could say it's really, really interesting to learn more about you and, and how you've worked through your career. And I know ESG has been a recurring theme on our show. And I know it's very, very important to you as well. So what advice do you have for companies who are maybe struggling to implement ESG or don't know how to even start? Yeah, that's a very great question. Yeah, ESG is now a trending terminology everywhere is mm -hmm. about ESG. But you know, my, my, my advice to companies, businesses, NGOs, whoever who is interested in ESG, first they should know ESG is not expensive. Uh, it's something very easy as long as you know what you really want to achieve in terms of environment, in terms of society, and is it possible for you to design a simple governance system in your organization so to be able to spearhead what you want to achieve. I'll give you an example. If you are, let's say, an agricultural company and you know you are using agrochemicals which can pollute water, so can you have a system where you can uh, you know, use less agrochemicals or can you have a system where you have a regular water quality you know monitoring can you provide training to your internal workers the best way how to apply agrochemicals so i mean esg is there it is not that expensive what is lacking is that commitment from the top leadership is what always makes esg to to implement across so many organizations yeah. And do you see the future of ESG? Is it going to, are we going to get there? Are we going to get those top leaders? And if not, how can we? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, like I said, ESG is a bit complex because of that. You hear the terminal like greenwashing, you know, you hear some companies saying we are doing that, we are doing that. Well, in the actual sense, they are not doing it. So I think we have to be transparent. For me, if I, I want people to have a better ESG, we need the honest. People should be transparent. And also not to make so big targets, because when you, you make big targets, that means you have so many pressure. Uh, you, right. you can even cook data to fool around that, hey, I'm doing that, just because you want to impress people. But I would say you just start small. You know, it's, it's like a baby. Uh, you, <laughs> you just start it small, you do one thing at a time. Uh, if you want to do like 10 things at the same time, you can't do that, because ESG also needs money, you understand? Yeah. So for me, I'm saying ESG, the future of ESG for right now, I can't say it is good or it is bad, but what I would say, we need to have ESG in our system, which is very, very transparent. And whoever is running the ESG program should be competent enough to understand the nitty gritty of what it is to have ESG in the business. Yeah. yeah. Uh. That's a perfect answer. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> um, I appreciate that. But uh, we also have a segment on the show we call Field Notes. And it's one of our favorite parts of the show where we ask our guests to share fun stories from being out in the field. And we mentioned earlier, <laughs> Tanzania has some incredible wildlife, some of the most incredible wildlife in the world. And, um, you know, a place where we can, you know, some we can't even imagine. So when you live that close to real wildlife, you have to have some great stories to share. Do you have any close encounters or anything like that? Yeah, I, I have. I remember that was the 2007 when I was in the Sadani National Park. I remember I was in the third year at the University of Dar es Salaam. So I remember I, I got chased down by the bull, the buffalo bull. <laughs> oh, uh, gosh. Yeah. So I, I got chased down by the, the buffalo bull. But then, uh, yeah, I was lucky enough to escape that encounter. I think for me, it has remained like one of the funniest, scariest moments <laughs> <laughs> in wildlife. But yeah, I mean, those are just the adventures which happens when you, when you interact with the animals. But that never deterred me from loving wildlife. So that's one of the things. So we also love to ask uh, our guests what they do for fun. And um, it sounds like you can do yours, your three, almost all at the same time. So sightseeing, wildlife photography, and hiking. So 
Tell us a little bit about what got you into those and maybe one of your more recent trips. Yeah, exactly. And I remember I had a chat with Lola. So right now I'm, um, I'm actually planning to do storytelling, storytelling of the fauna, fauna wildlife in the human environment. Because you see for now, most of the conservation activities are focused in the national parks, forest reserve, game reserves. But then he, this wildlife in human environment is ignored. So for me, I thought it is very important to do the documentation of the wildlife that we live with in our environment. So, and to do that, I'm planning to be doing the photography and then he tell the story. I interview people like, what do they know about a particular species? I want to know their cultural perspective, if that, that species has any significant value to them. So, through that, my understanding is perhaps I can raise a bit of awareness to the communities on how they can coexist with wildlife. So that's the project which I'm planning to do, but that is subject if I get the fund, I need to get it started. Yeah, tell us more about what you need to get started on that project. Well, thank you very much. So to get it started, that means I need a, a minimum, I mean, a maximum of 5,000 US dollar. So on 5,000 US dollar, that means I can have at least 3,500 USD to buy a perfect Nikon camera, which is recommended by most wildlife photographers. And uh, part of that money will be used to ship. You know, if I buy the camera from US, for example, it has to get to Tanzania. So it has to be shipped. But also when it lands in Tanzania, you have to clear the tax. So I would say if I have 5,000 USD, I buy the equipment, I get it transported to Tanzania, then I can get it started. Yeah. Okay. So how about I buy the camera and then I'll come with it and hand it to you? <laughs> <laughs> that, will, that is awesome. And, and actually, Laura, uh, even I don't need the money. If you can buy, if somebody can buy the camera, send it to me. <laughs> I don't send even, it back. I don't even, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that would be lovely. <laughs> all right well we have a lot of people listening who um who love wildlife and our photographers environmental professionals love photography we're all out mm -hmm. in the field looking at beautiful things all day so yeah. you never know we'll see what happens exactly yeah do you have a favorite i mean there's so many iconic species in tanzania do you have a favorite ah you know for me wildlife is all wildlife species are favorite because i know yeah. nature <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. every species has got its own if, uh, ecosystem function. So I wouldn't say that is better. Or that. If I say I like earthworm, people will, will laugh at me. Like, why yeah, do right. you like your earthworm? <laughs> 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 you understand? If yeah. I tell people I like you fungi. So I, I tell people that, why don't you like lion? And I say, hey, guys, listen, we have small critters who, which does a lot of, you know, ecological yeah. function that than even the big five so for me someone like who likes to see the health soil health food i think i like worms a lot and um and, and unfortunately if someone would decide to give me like which phd you want to do i would say i want to do something related to soil conservation you understand oh, so yeah, yeah i love the wildlife that most people cannot see and those <laughs> reside oh, awesome. in, the, in the soil, yeah. Well, that, yeah, but they, those are the ones that need strong advocates, right? Because everybody <laughs> talks about the big five. And, exactly. Uh, yeah, but there's so many other species that, that are, I mean, some that are even more important, like you mentioned. So exactly. that's really neat. It's really, really neat. Uh, and and we, these days we call uh, species discrimination. When we, we say species discrimination, it's like we tend to focus on some species, we ignore others. Like yeah. you say now, people here talk about cheetah, tiger, the, mm -hmm. the giant panda. They talk about pangolin, but what about the porcupine? Eh? Mm -hmm. eh? yeah. What about the maugan tree species, which is disappearing? You understand? Yeah. So I, I think for me, yeah, of course I know we, we already have some threatened and endangered species. Of course we need strong action, but that should not be the reason to forget the other species. You understand? Right. Yes. Yep. Yes, absolutely. And uh, it's a challenging effort because, you know, it's it's easier to, to light, you know, you can see lions, it's really, it's a lot easier. So those that having an advocate for smaller species, 
is really, really important because yeah, what you see on TV isn't necessarily exactly. what you see in the world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think some other things while we have you here is what is a day in the life of living in Tanzania? Like I've been to Kenya, so I've been near to you. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Um, but knowing like, what is your day? Like outside of work, even just what is it like yeah. living in Tanzania? Yeah. You see Tanzania is, uh, I mean, it's a beautiful country in terms of PC. People are very lovely. Uh, we are very social. That, that's the African culture. It's not perhaps like you as or <laughs> so far. <laughs> we are like, we are social animals. Uh, we like to interact a lot and the weather is very good. We don't have those four seasons like you have in, in the US. So here it is a dry season mm-hmm. or rainfall season. In between is the sun. Like now, you can see the sunshine is very strong. Yeah. Uh, so we have, you know, fresh food we eat here. I mean, life here, to be honest, when I, I, I was doing my master's in, in Brussels, Belgium, um, for two years, I think I, I missed Tanzania a lot because of the, I mean, these countries are, are too different in terms of people, the food we eat, the mm-hmm. lifestyle. So, Rola, you've been to Kenya, perhaps we are more or less the same, eh? In yeah. terms of lifestyle. Yeah. That's what I can say. Life here is very beautiful. Yeah. I can imagine. And then you said Tanzania, right? Us Americans are saying it wrong, aren't we? Uh, okay, Tanzania, okay. <laughs> Tanzania. <laughs> Tanzania. Tanzania. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But uh, I just um, can't. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I was actually going to ask you about food. You know, one of the challenges we have here is everything is three steps removed from where it came from. So we don't have a lot of fresh food. And mm. I don't know if there's a, is there is a particular dish that you like at all, or is there, I mean, is there a group of food, different types of food that you prefer? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, absolutely. You see in Tanzania, we have about 120 plus tribes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So each tribe has got its own favorite food. Yeah, right, right. So for me, I'm, from Lake Victoria, specifically a place or a town called Bukoba. And Bukoba, our food is banana, you know, banana. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So banana, I can eat it in the morning for breakfast, <laughs> yeah, for lunch, <laughs> yeah. for dinner. But then the funny thing, my wife, she's from another tribe. She's a skuma. For them, they, it is all about rice and, you know, ugali. You have Lola, have you seen Ugali? Yep. So, so my wife, my wife tribe is all about rice and Ugali. So those are, uh, I, I'm not saying rice and Ugali is my favorite. It's not my favorite because of my wife, <laughs> sometimes I eat, you know. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, so, I understand. When you come to Tanzania, it depends where you are. But let me tell you, rice and Ugali is so, so common in Tanzania, wherever you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They have become like a national food. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So I yeah, loved so, all the food we ate in Kenya. It was so good. Mm, exactly. Yeah. And the, those two countries have a really good relationship, it seems. Is that pretty accurate? Yeah. I mean, you know, they say in politics, you don't have a permanent enemy. You don't have a permanent uh, friend. friend. So, right. yeah. But then, he, yeah, he, overall, I would say the relationship is, is good. It's good. Yeah. Not bad. Yeah, and your other neighbors as well. I mean, is it just t- typically pretty? Yeah, other neighbors we have like Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Congo. So, in terms of political relationship, diplomatic relationship, economic relationship, we don't have any issue except some of these challenges you hear from Congo. There is some, you know, cultural conflict which has been going on. Otherwise, this regional, I yeah. would say, it is, is it stable? Overall, it's very stable. Yeah. And do yeah. the other, the, your neighboring countries, do you guys actually work together on bigger biological projects or is it all kind of each country does its own thing? No, yeah, it depends. For, you know, this ecosystem, which are, you know, traversing those areas, like, right. mm-hmm. like Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria is in Uganda, mm-hmm. in Kenya and Tanzania, although Tanzania, we own like 60% of the lake. So there was, Lake Victoria environmental management plan. So that means it has to be all those three countries to work together. But also, where I am with the Kigoma, there is what they call a rift 
uh, it called Albertine ecosystem. So Albertine ecosystem, that means from Tanzania, Congo, Rwanda, and Burundi. So those countries, they have to work together to make sure that ecosystem eh, is yeah. functioning very well. Yeah. But also if you go to southern uh, Tanzania, you have Niasa Wildlife Corridor. So Niasa Wildlife Corridor runs from Tanzania all the way to Mozambique. So oh, wow. WWF is working on that ecosystem. Don't forget about Masai Mara when you have the wide beast migration. Mm-hmm, from the Serengeti yeah. to North yeah. Mara. So, I mean, so it depends where you are. If you go to like Malawi, like Nyasa, we have the Malawi, we have to conserve. So those countries sharing the, the, that ecosystem, they have to work together jointly to mm-hmm. make sure they protect it. So, yeah, there are some sorts of the initiatives. Oh, yeah. Well, that's really interesting. That's really yeah, cool. Yeah, that's great. Well, we are coming close to the end of our time. So is there anything else you wanted to talk about today that we didn't get to? Well, I, I think for me, what I, I would like our listeners to hear is um, right now the world is in a, in a very big crisis. And when I say crisis, I mean three many crises. We have the climate change. We have the nature loss, that is biodiversity loss. But also we have the issue of you know, pollution. Um, but the question is, what can we do? What can we do about it? It's not all about the government, the, the, the big companies. I mean, yeah. For me, I like to say each one of us can do something, can do something to change this world. I see people, they buy food, they eat food, they throw a lot of food. But I tell people, when you throw food, you throw the land, you destroy habitat because the more you throw, that means we need more land. So I think every one of us has to be a leader, has to take initiative to make sure that we have a better planet for all living organisms. Absolutely. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's a great, great answer. Yeah, great ending message. So lastly, where can people get in touch with you if they want to follow up with you? For me, in terms of social media, I, I am on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, you can share my profile name if you yeah. want. Yeah, you have got my email, you can share my email as well. Otherwise, yeah, i would be very, very happy to get support of my of the camera because if you do documentation in Tanzania, that can change someone else. Uh, attitude. So I will really look forward to get some support so I can get started on, on the project. Awesome. Well, hopefully yeah. next time we talk to you, you are a, um, you have your more awards and maybe one in, in film creation. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, that's our show. Thanks so much, Godfrey, for joining us today. As always, please be sure to check us out each and every Friday. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. See you, everybody. Bye.